world generally and just sort of make clear what's happening and what's not happening today. So exchanges and firms that buy and sell stocks and commodities are required to keep their company money um, separate from their customers' money. They can't gamble with their customers' money like it's their own. That's correct. Correct. And is that required of crypto exchanges right now? No. And does any federal agency have enforcement authority to require that? I believe that the Securities Exchange Commission has authority. Okay. When a firm is being paid by their customers to give advice on how to invest their money, they are required to put their customers' interests first, not their own business interests. That's their fiduciary responsibility. That's correct, right? Correct. And is that required of crypto exchanges right now? No. And does any federal agency have enforcement authority to require that? Again, and I'll clarify my previous response with respect to the SEC over security tokens only, not commodity tokens. Right. This is where the gap exists between us and the SEC. But based on my understanding and hearing from the, uh, the chairman himself that they do have the authority to police this market. Okay. All right. The security market. Please. Right. Right. Because your distinction is whether what, what kind of a thing this okay, is. It is. Is it yes. a... Is it a commodity thing or is it a stock thing? Correct. Right. Um, companies that are investing other people's money are required to get the best possible price by looking at the best deal across multiple markets, right? That's called best execution. Is, is that required for crypto trading right now? No. Okay. And is there any enforcement authority anywhere in the federal government that would require that? Uh, I... I, I Again, if my assumption based on the authority that the SEC has over securities and over security tokens, then they can impose the same requirements that they impose on traditional securities, then based on that sort of logic, they would have that authority over security tokens. Okay. Okay. So, um, and I have one last question. So banks and other financial services firms have a duty to know who their customers are. Um, they, that's how we protect against money laundering and keeping crooks and criminals from using legitimate businesses to wash their dirty money. Um, is that the case for crypto-related enterprises? So I, I think this is a little bit distinguishable from your previous questions because this goes to some of the state money transmitter licenses that exist for these crypto exchanges on a state-by-state -state basis. And there are registration requirements with FinCEN, which would have AML and KYC um, requirements. And with that in mind, I think there might be some element of what your concern and issues are, but maybe not as comprehensive as a federal regulatory regime over the marketplace that we have with traditional markets. Thank you, thank you. So I think that um, I appreciate your, the brevity of your answers because I think that what this shows us, the, the crypto world of FTX shows us what can happen when there aren't basic consumer protections. And you know, I don't care whether you're buying wheat or stocks or FTT, which is the digital coin that was created by FTX, or whether you're buying some derivatives of those assets, the market should be fair and not rigged, and that's the problem. I would also argue that we know how to do this. Crypto is a new thing, but the rules of the road for how to ensure that markets are fair and that financial institutions um, you know, know what's happening, I mean, those rules are not new. And it seems, Madam Chair, that our job is to figure out how we can enforce the laws that we have and then plug the holes uh, where those holes exist, or we're going to see more disasters like FTX. Agree. Thank you. Let me just um, ask one last question because I have a bit more time. Um, there are obviously real concerns about FTX collapse and future swings in crypto markets um, as this instability has unfolded. Since you serve also, uh, Chair Benham, on the um, financial, uh, the FSOC, um, and I'm sure that this is something that you think about as well, the impact of, of crypto on general financial stability, could you comment on that and how you see that issue? So I think thus far it hasn't been uh, of huge concern, and if you look back to the spring when we had uh, the Terra Luna collapse and then now with the FTX collapse, um, the banking system and the market system have been largely siloed from the crypto system, and I think that is a testament to the, 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 the value of our banking regulatory system and our market system um, and keeping that crypto market out. I, I, at this point, given the current size, and I was here a year ago, I think we were talking about $3 trillion in market cap, and now it's well under a trillion itself. Um, there is no 
direct impact to financial stability. But it's not something that I think we can rest our laurels on. We have to think about what ifs and what may happen in the future. And these are the types of things that concern me is we can't just assume things will remain the same and things will be safe. We have to be aggressive. We have to be thoughtful of different scenarios. And we have to assume with gaps in the system, as you pointed out, future crises will continue to occur. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Tuberville. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for being here. Kind of remind me of sitting in a chair after I got the heck beat out of me in the football game and knowing the other team didn't go by the rules, and I had to explain why, and there's really no way around it. Uh, we've screwed this up. Uh, you got to have rules, and we've all seen this coming. I've invested in crypto. Uh, I didn't get as deep as some of these people have gotten, but it is a mess and it's gonna get worse if we don't get control of it, but we got confidence that you will with our help. Uh, we've been trying to help. So, uh, you know, this country needs to be the leader in the world, you know, in financial regulation, you know, all the innovation. And if we don't, we're gonna be in trouble. China's got their own, own digital currency that's cranking up. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a huge problem. I've got people calling me from everywhere going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about this? Well, it's new. Uh, it's totally new, and you go through some hard times, and unfortunately, you got a lot of people that have lost money in this, and, but we've got to get control of it so people get confidence in digital currency, bottom line. So i got a, just a couple of questions here. Uh, first of all, you said you met with uh, Sam, and, of course, we've had him in hearings before. Uh, you got any text or emails with him over the years? Yeah, so in addition to the, I, I pointed out to Senator Stabenow's um, question, I, I mentioned there was this sort of dog, dogged uh, desire to get this application uh, approved, and my approach to that application, given the issues and the strong feelings, was that I needed to be as transparent and open with, with him and FTX, as well as other CEOs who felt the same. So um, there were a number of emails and messages back and forth all about the application, about the status of the application. Some of the messages were about scheduling the 10 meetings I mentioned, uh, but it was about updates, giving us, um, again, this dogged approach to we, we submitted answers to the questions from the division, or we have more data to just support their advocacy of this application, all in relation to the application. Okay, good, thank you. Uh uh, Chairman Gensler is using the, this collapse to argue that the SEC should run point on crypto regulation, but he has repeatedly cut off pathways for crypto firms to register at his agency. You know, what have you done at the CFTC to encourage digital asset firms to register and enter the regulatory fold? Senator, this is, you know, it's a great question, but this is at the heart of, of the problem, right? We, we've had um, since you know, really 2016, 2017, we've seen an influx of these crypto firms coming to the CFTC to list derivatives products, whether on incumbent or existing registered exchanges, but also crypto firms buying existing derivatives exchanges and starting to list crypto derivatives. Um, new products emerging and new ways that the crypto community can get into derivatives exchanges. But ultimately, and this is the reference I think you're making, in terms of regulation of cash markets, right, the spot market, we simply do not have authority to register cash market exchanges or any intermediary, broker, dealer, or entity within that structure, and that's what concerns me, right? This is the gap. This is the gap that exists. This is the gap that FSOC pointed out, and ultimately, again, to your point, if we don't do something, customers are gonna continue to lose money, and we're gonna be right back here again in a couple months. Exactly. Uh, on another point here, going back to FTX, uh, you know, these major environmental social governance, ESG, uh, ratings companies gave FTX high marks, very high marks for corporate governance. We have since learned that the exact opposite was true. Uh, what federal agency is responsible for auditing these ESG rating reports? What needs to be done to protect investors from inaccurate reporting by ESG rating companies, and can these people be sued when they do something like this? Senator, I, you know, I think it would depend on if, if these are um, products that are being traded and there's an ESG rating on it, then naturally I think 
if it was a security pro financial product, it would be the SEC that would have to come up with some sort of rating mechanism. But um, I, I, I don't know for sure that it would necessarily be the SEC or potentially an other department that might have the authority. But you point out a potential gap in who are the rating agencies. This was an issue in 2008 with the financial crisis. Who is overseeing rating agencies and what are the conflicts of interest there and what actions are they taking and is it truly an objective rating to give consumers and investors the information that they need? So this, should this be in some kind of bill that we do with crypto? To the extent that the issue you raise is a significant problem and one that crypto firms are getting ESG related ratings, then I think it's something that we should talk about further and make sure that this goes to the heart of disclosures and customer information, which is, I think, is a part of at least the DCPA and the bills that are being proposed. Investors need information. We need to bridge the gap between an issuer, a rating agency, and an investor so they know exactly what information they have and they can make the most informed decision. But certainly would welcome the opportunity to work with you and see if we can do something in this Well, case. as we go through this investigation, hopefully, if we look into some of these investors into FTX, we find out, did you look at this ESG report? Did yep. you look at, uh, you know, their credence? Uh, Absolutely. Did you invest because of that? Somebody could get in trouble over this, and we need to really look into this. We've got people out there doing things they shouldn't be doing, especially when it comes to finances and people losing millions and millions of dollars. But uh, look forward to working with you. I know you'll get control of it. Uh, uh, look forward to people uh, having the opportunity to continue to invest in crypto, but also understand that there's rules and regulations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I welcome uh, Chair Benham. Nice to see you again. Thanks for serving in so many capacities our country. And thank you, Chair Stabenow, for hearing this, holding this hearing. And we just briefly, quietly talked about how important this is. So thank you. Uh, the failure of FTX is shocking to all of us, not only for the misconduct, but also for the speed of the collapse. Many critical questions have emerged about the abuse of customer funds and also about the business model in conflicts of, of many other crypto firms also. It's troubling the contagious effect um, as FTX's connections across the crypto markets have pushed other firms into failure. You know all that, of course. We must make sure we learn the right lessons from this failure. It means creating a, fam a framework that, that, that's, that safeguards the traditional financial system, that protects consumers, that doesn't put the crypto companies first. Yesterday, I wrote to Secretary Yellen. I look forward to working with her and all the financial regulators to achieve that. Uh, Chair Benham, one of the more troubling issues related to crypto is its role in illicit finance and the threat it poses to national security. I, while I didn't hear his comments, Senator Marshall's comments, I, I was told he spoke eloquently and, and directly and how, about the importance of, of safeguarding um, our national security in light of some of the crypto abuses. The Banking Committee, Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, which I chair, held a hearing in March about cryptocurrencies, how they provide hackers and scammers anonymity and um, immediate transferability, facilitating cyber crimes like ransomware attacks. That month, the North Korea state-sponsored cyber group carried out one of the largest virtual asset heists ever, worth over $600 million, and then laundered the proceeds. We need to be vigilant about that. FinCEN recently reported that Bank Secrecy Act filings related to ransomware reached over $1 billion in 2021, more than double what they were in 2020. We don't know what 2022 will show, but we, we need to be concerned. So my questions, first question, do we need to make combating the use of crypto and illicit finances finance more of a priority across all of the federal regulators? Yeah, Senator, thank you for the question. Thank you for the letter uh, also to Secretary Yellen. We did see it and certainly look forward to working with you and Treasury Department. This is uh, a, an enormously important issue. You pointed out, Senator Marshall raised it as well. Um, there is so much uh, opacity and, and potential activity in, in the shadows around illicit acti activity using cryptocurrency and digital assets. I, I, you know, as you pointed out, Treasury is doing an excellent job with the tools they have. I think there's a technology curve that we're all learning and trying to climb right now to understand how this technology works and to identify illicit activity. But we will certainly, to the extent we have within our enforcement authority, work with Treasury, work with OFAC, FinCEN, as you said, under the Bank Secrecy Act and other authorities to make sure we're rooting out um, any illicit activities possible. But I would say comprehensive regulation, as you've suggested and proposed, 
is going to be a, an important and critical tool to take a step in the right direction and identify all of this illegal activity. Thank you. You play an important role in this. I appreciate your acknowledging Treasury and their action plan to mitigate the illicit uh, finance risk of digital assets, what they issued in September. Uh, that's a key step, and the, the fact that you all all understand how this is cross-agency, so thank you. Uh, the, the FTX collapse demonstrates the inherent conflicts and even worse self-dealing uh, in some crypto business models. We know it's important to avoid dangerous incentives in the financial service industry. For example, banks have restrictions of proprietary trading and transactions with affiliates as do registered investment companies. Wouldn't safe, similar safeguards make sense for crypto firms? Absolutely. The, the idea that we have, as you pointed out, uh, I mean, just thinking about the, the markets that the SEC oversees, that we oversee, the idea that an exchange can act as a dealer, can act as a lender, can act as a custodian, uh, just doesn't work. It doesn't exist in our existing traditional financial system, and I think those same principles and regulations should apply to crypto. So are there other, are there other conflicts that should be addressed or prevented? Have you thought about sort of looking at that? So based on what we know with what happened to FTX and then certainly what we know with other traditional uh, crypto firms and the services that they uh, offer to clients, it seems to be the exchange traded function, the market making function, the broker dealer function, a lending function, and then a custodian. That is a long list of things that typically do not occur by a single institution. There may be other things certainly look worth looking into would work with you and your staff, but those are core elements that we see the services being provided and certainly could never be allowed in traditional financial systems. Thank you, and I, and I appreciate working with Chair Stabenow, uh, your focus on your jurisdiction here, um, that crypto products understanding touch not only commodities markets, what you work on, but also securities and, and banking. Um, your comments have already indicated what you think about that, but one more last question and, and to expand on that. Would you commit to continue working with the other regulatory agencies to, to minimize these gaps and to make sure consumers in the financial markets are fully protected? Senator, it, it's the absolute most important priority. Uh, there, there's been you know, a narrative about a power grab. This is the, the farthest thing from it. It is about filling a gap and doing what we can do as a commodity market regulator to fill the gap to protect customers and to prevent us from having to be here again talking about another bankruptcy. Thank you, and I've had individual conversations and one on one and through the committee process with a number of the other regulators, especially FEC, or especially SEC, um, and even the Fed, a little more distantly, the Fed and Treasury and, and uh, FDIC and all of them. So of course, I know, you, I, I understand your sincerity here and your genuineness and how important that is. Uh, last point, uh, Madam Chair, I ask the Chair's consent to enter into the hearing record a letter from the North American Securities Administrators Association highlighting considerations for Congress. So ordered without objection. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Grassley. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, when I uh, bring up the word whistleblower, I don't do it in the sense of the legal sense of the word whistleblower, but uh, I always try to get people like you to listen to what's going on in the department and take an action on it so people don't have to become what you call official whistleblowers. So we've heard many reports that uh, people involved with the FTX had concerns about its business practices. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that anyone stepped forward to report on what was going on. Did your office receive any uh, reports uh, of wrongdoing involving FTX? And if not, uh, do you believe employees would have stepped forward if the program was uh, better publicized? Senator, uh, we did not receive any tips or whistleblowing activity about FTX, uh, and we looked at that very thoroughly over the past few months to ensure that was the case, and that is in fact the case. We did not receive anything. Um, certainly appreciate your support of our whistleblower program. It has been extremely effective in supporting our enforcement division and the enforcement actions we've brought at record-breaking numbers. We do everything we can at the agency, but I will commit to do more than we're doing to ensure that whistleblowers feel safe and protected and that they can come to us without fear of uh, retribution. Since we got my bill passed, do you have the money to pay the whistleblowers? We are currently in a good place, uh, but I think we do need to continue to work uh, on, on, on making sure that the program is effective 
the reason that we've had a challenge is not a bad reason. It's because we've rewarded so much money to whistleblowers and the cases we've brought have been so significant. I hope that continues because we have a huge participant pool and a lot of fraud that we need to police. But I appreciate your support in working with us and we'll ensure that your bill is passed and it supports the program and that we can continue making these significant payments to whistleblowers. Uh, you told us in uh, previous testimony how many times you met with representatives of uh, FTX. Uh, uh, Sam uh, Bankman said that he had spent tens of thousands of hours with the CFTC. Uh, in regard to you personally, have you made your calendar public? And if not, when could we expect that to happen? Thanks, Senator. As I mentioned to Senator Stabenow, we've taken an initial look at my calendar, and as I said, we've had uh, over the past 14 months 10 meetings with Mr. Bankman-Fried and his team. There were two phone calls and a few messages all related to either scheduling the meetings or giving us information about an application. And I would just emphasize that to you. The relationship that the CFTC had with FTX was about the regulated clearinghouse, Ledger X. It had nothing to do with the activity that was happening offshore or the spot exchange, which we don't regulate. As I said, they were dogged in their approach to getting this clearinghouse application approved, which meant Mr. Bankman Fried and his team meeting a lot of CFTC staff over the course of many, many weeks and months, and many meetings, as I said, 10 meetings with me and other communications to just share information with us, update information about the application, and doggedly give us as much information in advocacy of their application. That said, we'll take a fresh look uh, given the initial review and get that up to the committee as soon as possible. Uh, in regard to just what you said about Ledger, uh, and I think you've answered some of my questions, but did the CFTC ask for any financial information or organizational charge? And can you provide the committee what FTX shared with the with your commission? Senator, it's a, an important question, and unfortunately, our legal limitation in terms of authority to ask questions or to examine entities stopped at the regulated entity. We at the CFTC do not have legal authority to police, to examine, or to ask questions about an unregulated entity. The only circumstance is if we get a whistleblower tip, if we get a referral, or if we, if we have information that is gonna meet the test to get a subpoena in court after passing the commission vote. That's the only way we could then start asking questions and use subpoena authority to start investigating or examining a non-registered entity. And this really goes to the heart of an issue that we have right now, but I will say, in contrast, that legal limitation is the same reason that customer money in the Ledger X entity is safe and it is where it's supposed to be. But I certainly look forward to working with you if you'd like to see if there can be a change to that authority, but it is a, it is a delicate balance that we have to approach. But to repeat myself, there is no existing authority to ask questions beyond the regulated entity. You know, the guy that is now CEO of FTX, uh, he was involved with the Enron liqui liquidation. Uh, he said he's uh, never seen such a complete failure of corporate controls and complete absence of trustworthy financial information. So getting back to what uh, Bankman Freed said uh, about FTX spending tens of thousands of hours with the CFTC, uh, I'd like to know how did the CFTC miss this complete lack of corporate control? So, Senator uh, John Ray, who's the individual you're referencing, when he talks about complete lack of controls, he's talking about the non-CFTC companies. Chairwoman Stabenow mentioned in her statement that John Ray made a statement about Ledger X, the CFTC entity, and he said there's good governance, there's liquidity, there's, there's capital, and it's fully operational, and it's in good shape. So John Ray was very clear that the CFTC regulated entity is healthy, capitalized, and operational. And that's in stark contrast to the non-regulated entities. But it's for that reason exactly, and the limitation that I shared with you earlier, that we do not have legal authority to go beyond the regulated entity. And since the regulated entity was fully in compliance, fully operational, 
and met all of the legal requirements of the CFTC, we had no basis or reason to sort of pierce through the entity and start phishing or asking questions about affiliate entities or non-CFTC registered entities. In regard to the bill that was introduced uh, in uh, August or sometime this summer, uh, and if you've been working with people on that legislation, is there anything in that legislation that ought to be rewritten from what we know now from FTX? Senator, thanks for the question. Certainly, given the circumstances of the past few weeks, I think we should take a pause and look at the bill and make sure there are no gaps or no holes. We're going to learn more information about FTX in the coming weeks, and we will certainly take that information and share it with the committee. Two things that have come to mind in terms of what we've learned thus far and where the bill may be strengthened, disclosures around financial information of the entity, the crypto entity, and conflicts of interest. Obviously an issue that many members have talked about today given the brazen conflicts that occurred at the non-regulated entity. And I think there should be an effort both by the committee and we certainly look forward to supporting you in tightening and strengthening the conflicts of interest provisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to someone who spent a whole lot of time on this, and thank you for your leadership and co-sponsorship of the bill, Senator Gillibrand. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Benham, for being here, and thank you for taking the committee through what happened here and what role the CFTC has played and could play in the future. And I want to drill down on a couple areas where I still see risks that are coming ahead. I think you've made it very clear to the committee that comprehensive leg legislation is necessary. Um, Senator Lummis and I wrote a very broad bill for all committees of jurisdiction, including the Banking Committee, including the Finance Committee, including the Intelligence Committee. But what the Ag Committee has done is focused on your jurisdiction, and this bill that the Chairman and mm -hmm. Ranking Member have put together is quite comprehensive. And I will be very grateful for you to give us the guidance about how to improve that, as well as the um, framework bill that Cynthia Lummis and I put together. Um, I'm very concerned about um, the issues that you've talked about today, um, and I'm very concerned specifically with the potential of future problems. So responsible governance is something that uh, we've talked a lot about today, and the absence of which really contributed to the FTX's uh, debacle, especially its foreign um, registered entity. So for Senator Grassley, the difference between the foreign entity and the U.S.-based entity um, isn't necessarily clear. So I'm on the Intelligence Committee, and so I'm very concerned about who owns and who controls our critical infrastructure, such as platforms engaging in financial exchange and custodial services. My concern is particularly acute where foreign interests may conflict with those of the United States, and of course the FTX uh, debacle has shown bad actors, foreign and domestic, can contribute to global digital asset markets nefarious ends, harming United States consumers. The CFTC's current rules, I understand, provide that where ownership of the CFTC license exchanges changes at the holding company level, as when FTX US purchased the CFTC registered Ledger X digital asset derivatives exchange last year, the registrant has to notify the CFTC of the change of control. The Commission's current rules do not require detailed information about purchasing entity or its beneficial owners, nor do the current rules allow the Commission, where appropriate, to require conditions to the transaction to manage risk or to block the sale of, in exceptional circumstances. So, for example, if a hypothetical Chinese actor wants to acquire this entity who has questionable background and perhaps um, uh, criminal activity undisclosed, this is something that the CFTC should be able to um, inquire about. So specifically, please tell us how you would address these issues under our legislation for digital asset platforms, particularly those that's, that actually serve retail markets. Thanks, Senator Gillibrand. A extremely important question, and you rightfully point out the existing authority for the commission to ask questions about an acquisition or some sort of uh, corporate combination is limited. It is essentially a notice filing uh, at best. Mm -hmm. um, given the circumstances of the recent weeks, and this is not um, an issue that is uh, infrequent for the CFTC. We see a lot of consolidation and M&A activity in the derivative space. I think it's an important issue, particularly with your interests around cyber and critical infrastructure. Uh, and this is not unlike the CFIUS process in, in some respects, which this committee has been very focused on over the years. What can we do to strengthen that authority for the CFTC 
to be able to ask questions, to be able to demand books and records, to be able to demand information about personnel, management, system safeguards, going to your cyber issue, um, so that we can better screen and evaluate the, the acquiring company and what role or impact it might have on the CFTC regulated entity. Mm -hmm. um, and then to follow on Senator Grassley's line of questioning about the co undisclosed conflicts of interest. Obviously, Sam Bankman Fried had um, several other entities that were double dealing or using assets that should have been um, not located in an area where he could have used them. We had allegations of um, inadequate books and records. We have allegations of um, how FTX's own tokens were reportedly used as collateral by customers and affiliated entities for massive loans. So these are just an enormous numbers of conflicts of interest that will be investigated. Please describe under um, the proposed legislation by both Senator um, Bozeman and Senator Stabenow, as well as um, the more um, uh, framework-oriented bill with Cynthia Lummis, how the CFTC would address these conflicts and does that legislation provide the commission with sufficient leeway to ensure identification, mitigation, disclosure, and where appropriate prohibition of these conflicts? Senator, you know, this goes to the heart of market regulation. I've mentioned this before, these issues that you rightfully point out around conflicts of interest, about uh, custody of funds, about books and records to examine, um, about financial resources to make sure that an entity has financial resources to, to you know, be a going concern uh, over a period of time. I, I think that the current bill is um, very effective in addressing nearly all of these issues. As I sent to Senator Grassley, I think it's important that we tighten the conflicts of interest provisions because of the egregious nature of what we learned with FTX. Um, and I think there's a way to do that. Disclosures to customers about financial resources also will be an important issue to address and certainly look forward to working with you on that. Um, in terms of authority and our experience at the CFTC, when we're able to impose these requirements on a reg regulated entity, it is quite um, uh, workable and, and, and effective. And I, I will use the Ledger X entity as an example. Mm -hmm. On a daily basis, we know where the customer money is. And we don't have to go through Ledger X. We go directly to the custodian with direct access to know and identify the customer money. Books and records, on demand, we are able to examine books and records. These are just some examples of the direct relationship that reg regulation provides. And I think in the, in the case of crypto and the bill DCCPA mm -hmm. and your bill with Senator Lummis, these would be the authorities we have and we could impose them and bring much more transparency to these unregulated entities. Okay, so I have one last question that you may not know the answer to. Um, but in your testimony, you just said that you thought that approximately 2% of FTX's customers of the international entity were U.S. persons. And so that would lead me to understand that either FTX lied or were untruthful about um, their business and they actually should have been registered with the CFTC or the SEC under current rules and subject to CFTC's fraud and manipulation authority. So how can the CFTC investigate more aggressively to deploy its current enforcement authority where overseas exchanges in fact have such significant and actual business within the U.S. putting U.S. persons and, US and the U.S. economy um, and other entities at risk. Thank you, Senator. So just for, and I, I'm happy to share this with the committee, but this was a disclosure document made by John Ray yesterday. It's a pie chart and it says, you know, where the lost customer money is across the globe. There's huge amounts of money in some um, sort of island jurisdictions, 2%, there's a sliver from the US. Um, under, uh, I, I feel fairly confident there are a number of US-based entities that have entities registered offshore that we're trading and will have exposure, and that's a huge issue. We should always think about institutions that have offshore entities that could potentially bring risk back to the US. From a retail perspective, and this is just my understanding, I've heard this for a number of years, some savvy retail investors are able to go around the, the virtual private networks, these VPNs that are essentially act as the firewall for an, an activity that happens offshore. That's an area that we could potentially look at. I don't know if it's an area that the CFTC has the expertise to look at, but, but perhaps we can work with other federal agencies to see how we can protect those firewalls and prohibit U.S. customers from getting around uh, those, those prohibitions. And I think this issue is one that the committee needs to understand. When you have a foreign registered entity, there are limitations about what we can actually regulate and how we can provide the oversight and accountability. 
Uh, but the examples that I brought up today are examples that could impact other businesses. So that's why I would like you to do some deep thinking about in this particular market of digital assets where there is always these workarounds and these abilities to get access to different markets and then the related lack of registration where there should be, um, it's going to be something that you will have to wrestle with. And I certainly, and I'm certain, certain this committee wants to help because if you've heard from every per person's testimony here so far, their constituents are very nervous about how this impacts U.S. markets and how it impacts U.S. persons. So that's why I think the bill that the chairwoman and ranking member have put together for this committee is so essential. If we don't regulate this industry, we're going to see more collapses, more bankruptcies, and a head-in-the-sand approach is absolutely unacceptable. And so we are very eager to work with you on solutions. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being here today. There's a lot of questions that are around FTX's self-minted exchange token, FTT, and it seems clear that FTX and Alameda Research used FTT and the token, I think it's pronounced Solana, uh, to inflate their own valuations and then misused it as collateral in their risky business investments and their ventures. So, Mr. Chairman, would the Digital Commodities Consumer Protect Act provide the CFTC or the SEC regulatory authority over transactions in FTX's exchange token, the FTT? So, um, from my understanding, and um, there was a, um, a sort of a compensation mechanism with the FTT token, there was an incentive mechanism. And I'm just sort of talking uh, in real time here. Based on that incentive mechanism, it probably uh, suggests characteristics that are more like a security and not a commodity. If that's the case, th this entity you're talking about is offshores, but we, let's assume it's onshore, then, then there would be onshore being in the U.S., and there would be authority within the SEC to oversee um, uh, that, that organization. Under the DCCPA, would the CFTC or the SEC have regulatory oversight over the Solana token? So uh, I, I don't want to opine on the Solana. I, I think either way, if, if we, we, we consider Solana a commodity under the DCCPA, that authority would be provided to the CFTC. Um, if Solana and, and work needs to be done, investigation, sort of analysis needs to be done, if Solana is a security, then the SEC has existing authority to police the Solana token. How many of these tokens are traded on the FTX US platform? Would, I, the, would, this, would this CTA or the CFTC have spot market oversight if, if on under the proposed legislation? Under the proposed legislation, the CFTC would have authority to register spot exchanges. So in that scenario, then the FTX U.S. entity would have been required to register with the CFTC. We would have had to go through a process to figure out which tokens are commodities and which are securities. The commodity tokens would have been listed on the CFTC registered exchange. And I think we've talked about this. There is likely going to be dual registration, which is not uncommon in our financial markets between securities and commodities. And with that registration and that lens into the registered entity, we would be able to prohibit conflicts of interest. So that's going to be helpful in the future. It's going to be, it is, it is, Senator, it goes to the core of the issue. It is critically important. It is the gap that exists that provides and presents customer protection risks. Okay. With the Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act, it instructs the CFTC to write rules and guidelines for all aspects of the legislation, including rules related to customer protection, margin or leverage trading of digital commodities, conflict of interest, lending activity, reporting of trades, and other information, and stable coins. So Mr. Chairman, what kind of timeline and rulemaking process do you expect to take place if this would become law? Senator, a tough question. It takes you guys forever, let's be honest. 
Uh, we would work vigorously and hard to get this done. I've obviously been a huge advocate for authority and understanding the risks that exist every day um, that, that goes by without action. I, I'm not, as the chairman, I'm not willing to accept that responsibility. I, I quickly, just for 20 seconds, using the post-financial crisis experience as an example, the CFTC was able to implement over 60 rules significant rules over the swaps market in a period of about three years. So if we can cut that 60 number, and it would be cut significantly with the DCCPA, probably down to single digits, I am confident that we would do everything in our power to get the rules done as soon as possible, and hopefully within a 12-month to 18-month basis at would it Would it be helpful if Congress would provide more guidelines? around the statutory provisions? Yes. Well, it's a difficult balance because as, as drafted now, and again, we need to take a fresh look at the bill given the circumstances of the past few weeks, but it's a balance between providing sufficient statutory authority and direction, but not too much, not too prescriptive, such that the agency can't evolve with the marketplace um, through the rulemaking process. Obviously, as you know, the statutory process, the legislative process is a key critical component, but the rulemaking process, which goes through the APA, the public uh, comment uh, and reporting period, this is a critical element of the process. And I think as drafted now, notwithstanding some changes that we may need to make given the circumstances of the past few weeks, it's drafted in a, in a, in a, in a very good way that balances prescription and direction with enough flexibility to evolve with changing technology. Mr. Chairman, when you were uh, here last before the committee, you and I had what I thought was a really good exchange on the important role that state security regulators play in our, the patchwork of financial regulatory systems that we have. And as a former state uh, securities regulator yourself, you know that state security regulators have a strong record of protecting and educating investors in matters involving those digital assets. But I, I do worry that communication between the federal and state regulators is lacking, uh, specifically as it comes to these digital assets. Do you uh, support inviting state security regulators to have a seat at the table and be more involved in, in the federal advisory boards and working groups related to these assets? Senator, absolutely. Uh, I was talking to Senator Tuberville about this before um, the hearing started um, and mentioning, uh, you know, Senator Brown submitted for the record the, the letter from NASA, which was submitted uh, yesterday. Um, I, I spoke to the head of NASA, Joe Borg, a few weeks ago just to share notes on what's going on with FTX. As you and I discussed the last time I was here, this is, and in my experience as a state regulator, this is boots on the ground at the local level. It couldn't be more important to have state security regulators working with local officials, working with local investors and local um, communities to make sure people understand the risks and understand uh, information that they need in order to invest their money appropriately. Thank you, and thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll turn now to Senator Lujan, and thank you for being a co-sponsor of this legislation. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and our, to our ranking member as well uh, for bringing us together yet again, but for your leadership on this issue as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for being with us again. When FTX US acquired LedgerX, it acquired an entity that was fully licensed and regulated by the CFTC. Despite this fact, there are widespread accounts at FTX and FTX US were mismanaged at the highest levels. Mr. John Ray, who is overseeing the bankruptcy filing, highlighted the scope of corporate negligence in the Chapter 11 filing for FTX when he said, quote, never in my career have I seen such a complete failure of corporate controls and such a complete absence of trustworthy financial information as occurred here. Uh, from the guy that liquidated, oversaw the liquidation of Enron. It's pretty startling. So my question, Mr. Chairman, and if you can answer this yes or no, <coughs> excuse me, did the CFTC have legal authority to examine the governance structure, balance sheet, or other financial documents for any entity other than Ledger X that was associated with this acquisition? No. 
Are there other instances where unregulated entities have acquired CFTC regulated products being legally offered to U.S. consumers? And what risk does this pose to American consumers? Senator, and this is, I think, goes to the conversation I had with Senator Gillibrand. You know, it's important as a lesson learned um, about what conflicts and what relationship a CFTC regulated entity has with other affiliates both in the US and across the globe. Currently the authority is limited to essentially a notice filing where the uh, registered entity would only have to give notice to the CFTC that they're being acquired or they're you know in some sort of consolidation or combination with another entity. Obviously, as we're learning now, this has huge potential impacts on U.S. investors. But I would say this, for the same reasons that we were not able, we the CFTC were not able to look into the other affiliates, which John Ray described as essentially a disaster, it was those same legal reasons that the FTX affiliates, while all of this illegal activity was happening, we're not able to pierce through the Ledger X entity and potentially steal or use US customer money out of Ledger X. And that's a tough balance. It's something we should think about collectively, but my job is to protect US customer money and CFTC regulated entities. And knowing what we did with Ledger X and what we are currently doing that is what I'm focused on. But certainly what, what we're learning, we should think about whether the policy is appropriate, whether it needs to change, and whether or not there are risk offsets to allowing us to go past the registered entity and what those risks are and what that cost benefit is between the registered entity and the non-registered entities. So what is the CFTC currently doing to ensure customer funds on Ledger X are safe? Thanks, Senator, for the question. We are in communication on a daily basis with both Ledger X and also the custodian. And we have a more direct relationship with the custodian to ensure that customer property, customer money is at the custodian. And this is both digital assets and also fiat money. We continue to have that relationship. The, the entity is operational. It's well capitalized. It has financial resources for 12 months on a rolling basis. It has books and records that we can examine, and we are ensuring all conflicts of interest and every requirement under CFTC law is met today and in the future. I appreciate that. Uh, I'll be asking you to submit an answer to this in the record, so I'll make sure I get it to you and I'll uh, submit it to the committee, but what corporate governance standards should be required for exchanges like FTX US? I know it's a long answer, uh, but I'm very interested in hearing from you directly on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the last time you appeared before the committee, you stressed that on issues like conflicts of interest, you would regulate spot digital assets similarly to how the derivatives market is currently regulated. Digital assets, however, are very different from traditional commodities and stocks. Since these assets are not tied to equity in a company, tangible good or hard currency, there's more volatility. Entities and tokens can be deeply interconnected through smart contracts. And when the asset itself is digital, the risk from security vulnerabilities and hacks are much higher. So my, my question is, what special considerations are necessary when setting rules for digital commodity platforms? Senator, thank, thank you for the question. I, I stand by you know, what I said probably a few months ago, and I probably said many times in the past, and even today, the core fundamentals of market structure are what we should rely on and lean on and anchor ourselves in as we think about what a regulatory structure would look like for digital assets. However, you make an extremely important point that there are distinguishing factors between traditional assets, whether it's a commodity or a security, and digital tokens, whether they're securities or commodities. I think the two key elements are essentially what you raise is custody and cybersecurity. And how are we going to utilize the tools we have in terms of custody and how we custody digital assets and what do we need to do from a CFTC perspective it's called system safeguards to protect the entity and the institutions from potential cyber hacks and cyber attacks and those are things that would come through the rulemaking process uh, but I certainly would welcome a rethink of the current DCCPA to strengthen those guidelines around cybersecurity through system safeguards, and that's a core principle, 
or what the custodian relationship is and what um, minimum requirements a custodian of digital assets should have in order to protect those assets and appreciate some of the fluctuations and the volatility that these assets have because um, they're intertwined with a much larger system uh, of financial resources. Appreciate that. And Madam Chair, I have a few other questions. I'll submit them into the record and I yield back. Thank you very much, Senator Lujan. And Senator Thune, who is also a co-sponsor. Yes, Bill. indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member Bozeman for having today's hearing uh, and giving us the opportunity to examine um, this recent collapse. Um, and, and Chairman, thank you for appearing in front of the committee today. Uh, my, my dad, who um, was born before the stock market crash and then went through the Great Depression, always said, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And I think that's, um, it looks like this whole thing, there just wasn't any there there. I mean, I don't know how they were able to pull this off for as long as they did, um, obviously being offshore and, and not being subject to you know the visibility that uh, regulators might otherwise have, but it's just really pretty stunning. And I'm, as everybody is here, I think deeply troubled by all the information that's come to light as it relates to what appears to be at the very least some incredibly serious wrongdoing on the part of FDX. And I think that whole collapse, again, underscores the need for greater oversight and transparency of the digital asset marketplace. I think that's why we need a comprehensive regulatory approach for uh, digital assets that ensures that uh, federal regulators have the proper tools to oversee this market. And I, it's increasingly clear that Congress needs to act and needs to act soon. Um, could you describe, you know, what enforcement actions uh, CFTC has taken or is considering to take following the collapse of FTX? Uh, Senator, un unfortunately, I, I can't talk about ongoing investigations, uh, but as I've said before in the past, uh, we will utilize every tool we have to the fullest extent of the law to bring wrongdoers uh, to account. Um, as I've said this before, we probably talked about this, it is an extremely powerful tool we have, enforcement over digital assets, but given this limited authority which you just referenced, Unfortunately, uh, when we act, it's often after the fact because the information that allows us to bring an enforcement action in digital asset cash commodity markets is only because information is coming to us from outsiders, from referrals, from tips, from and whistleblowers. And this is in stark contrast to some of the surveillance tools and examination tools that we would have if we had a comprehensive regulatory framework over digital asset commodities. And, and is the, the, your full commission engaged on this, on this issue? Absolutely. Um, are the CFTC and SEC uh, collaborating on this yes. investigation? Yes. Okay. Is um, CFTC currently considering, and I, and I know we're talking about a, a statutory legislative, uh, some guidance on this, but currently considering changes to its approach for oversight enforcement activity of other digital commodity platforms since the collapse, uh, absent the, the legislative framework we're talking about? I, I think um, if we think about, it, it really comes down to the limited authority. We have a number of um, incumbent exchanges that have a wide variety of financial assets in the commodity space that also list um, Bitcoin and Ether futures contracts. There are a number of sort of new um, startup uh, trading platforms that are listing similarly situated um, futures contracts in Bitcoin and Ether. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we've had incumbent or native crypto firms buy existing licensed CFTC exchanges and start listing contracts. The authority for us to go beyond the, the registered entity is limited. Um, we have limited lens into the cash market, and this is no different in agricultural complex or energy or, or metals complex, um, but essentially it is when we get information about potential fraud or manipulation in a cash market is really the only time we have that uh, ability to, to go through the futures market and start scoping around the cash market. And that's, that's the handcuff we have. That's the gap that we have that we're not able to fill right now. And, and you did discuss, and I know it's been talked about some here already, um, Ledger X in your testimony. How, what would you say in terms of uh, the characteristics of the two, what sets Ledger X apart from FTX? Senator, just 
quite simply, it's a CFTC regulatory regime. Mm. I mean, it is a forceful, They're strong, registered. transparent regime that they had to comply with. And if they didn't comply with it, there would have been consequences. Period. And are there lessons, I mean, obviously learned from their registration with CFTC that, uh, that, that we ought to consider? I think, as I mentioned to Senator Gillibrand and Senator Lujan as well, this question about our ability to pierce through, I use that word, uh, the regulated entity. In this case, the questions that I'm getting today, we've gotten in the past, yeah. there have been some suggestions which are just false, that we had some authority to go into the FTX entities. We simply did not. It is a limitation. It's a wall off of our authority. Um, and I think that might be something to consider, but I would say it comes with risks, and that's what we need to balance, because what are those risks? Those risks are I couldn't come before this committee today and tell you I know exactly where customer money is in the ledger X entity. And that's what worries me, right? Mm -hmm. If we had that reciprocal relationship with non-registered entities, these other FTX affiliates, would that have given the FTX affiliates an opportunity to fish around ledger X and potentially take that customer money? In which case, that's not a message I want to be sharing with you. Right. And um, in terms of sort of the global situation, so you see global, you know, traded globally, um, regulatory structures in other places around the world, are there some where uh, that can act as sort of a model for how we might do things here? And, and is the lack of regulation other places create the kind of systemic risk uh, that um, seems like uh, is, could be very real in this industry absent that? Yeah, Senator, it's an important question because I think right now as in the regulatory community and having conversations with my colleagues here in the U.S. and overseas, it's this balance between validation and risk management and customer protections. And I err on the side of customer protections and risk management. And I'm not suggesting my colleagues don't care about that. We all care. That's, that's the number one priority. But you could see how, you know, this, this concern of if we regulate it, you're going to validate it. And why are we validating? Because a lot of people think that you know, not unlike what your father told you, like if, if it's not there, what's, what's the there there? And if it's too good to be true. But from my perspective as a market regulator, I don't think we can regulate this out of existence. And even if we tried to regulate it outside the borders of our country, it would still exist elsewhere. And that risk would inevitably come back to us through retail or institutional. And I don't want to keep coming back to this committee after another bankruptcy or after another failure it's just too important to take action. And I will remain agnostic on the success or failure of the technology. That's not my job. My job is to protect customers, to fill gaps, and to tell this committee what I think is important to do so that your constituents don't lose money and don't have the information they need to arm themselves when they're making investment decisions. Yeah, very good. All right, thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Senator Durbin. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chairman Benham, for being with us today. I'm glad that we're having this hearing. I know that we thought about it a few weeks back. The world has changed pretty dramatically, and it really became more compelling for us to move forward on this, and I'm glad that you're here. I know a little bit more about your agency than some because the CFTC is a major regulatory agency when it comes to a massive investment industry in the city of Chicago. Uh, and so I've watched it through the years as a member of the House, a member of the Senate, and have a great deal of respect for it. I've always felt that you are a legitimate cop on the beat, and that's one of the reasons why the integrity of the process in Chicago is respected, not just statewide and nationwide, but worldwide. So I want you to be strong and appropriately funded to regulate an industry which is very important to the state that I represent. That's my intro. Uh, that's not bad, right? Senator, I couldn't be more happy and thankful for that statement. So let's talk about FTX for a minute. Um, less than three years old, supposedly worth $32 billion, one million users, and it collapsed overnight. I saw what Mr. Bankman Freed was tweeting. I suppose that's where his users get their information. And he led them right up to the cliff, the edge of the cliff, and then they fell off and couldn't recover what they had invested in the process. I just might add, and I think it should be noted by all the members on this committee, 
there'll be a reporter waiting in the hall, I've already talked to her this morning, who will ask you, did he ever contribute to your campaign? I said, oh no, I never heard of the man. She said, you're wrong, Senator, he contributed to you. So the cryptocurrency people are active politically uh, and they are trying to achieve a political end here. It is their right as citizens of this country to do that, but it really calls on us to make sure that whatever we do is credible under those circumstances. How long will it take to unpack the FTX mess to be able to understand exactly what happened and where it stands today? Senator, I think, you know, we, we have a, a cursory understanding of what happened. We've mentioned this today, the commingling of funds, the conflicts of interest, the lack of a custodian to, to separate those funds, the lack of books and records, as John Ray has said, just a sort of complete disaster from the risk controls. I think that's fine at a cursory level. I think it's going to take months probably before we truly understand the extent and scope of the, uh, the failure. And who's going to do that investigation? Senator, as I mentioned to Senator Thune, you know, we, have, uh, we are a civil enforcement agency. We are using the full extent of our power under the law to police um, any infraction or violation of the law. I know my, our, our sister agencies across the U.S. and the globe are doing that as well. Enforcement cases take time, but we're moving expeditiously, and we understand the importance of this. So this legislation, which is before the committee to consider, is to en enhance or improve your authority in this area. Is that correct? It's to fill a gap over commodity spot tokens, correct. All right. So I find this interesting. I want to put it in this perspective. It seems to be there is a competition, at least at the Capitol Hill level, between those who believe there should be no regulation. To this is the new world order. Uh, you don't need the full faith and credit of any nation or known entity as long as your computer program is sophisticated enough. Uh, I'm skeptical of that personally, but that seems to be one point of view. The second point of view is CFTC is a nice agency, but it's a small agency, and this is a big, big problem and challenge. If it's going to take you months to figure out what happened to one of the larger players, when they collapsed overnight, how are you going to maintain the daily regulation of this industry that is, at least until the recent collapse, was mushrooming inside, in size? And there are some who say, you got a fundamental problem that you face here. When you want to fund the CFTC's activities, you come hat in hand to members of Congress because you need an appropriation. The SEC is largely funded by fees charged to those who are using the re regulated entities. Now, I know that you ask for a user fee as part of this. And as I understand it, your general appropriation is in the $300 million range for CFTC. Is that correct? $320 million. And you believe that the user fees you're asking for from this digital industry will generate how much? Well, Senator, it depends on how much appropriators set the level at. And that would obviously require collaboration with us, but what we would have to do if the DCCPA passed at the agency level is determine what funds we needed to implement the rules and to enforce and impose the rules and then provide a request to you and you would set the level not unlike the SEC and then we would collect those fees requisite with what you set the level at. So ultimately Congress has something to say about the user fees? You have all to say. So the reason I'm doing this is to put it in the context. Mr. Bankman Freed, my contributor, uh, and people just like him are going to be spending a lot of money to make sure there's as little regulation as possible. And unfortunately, you are a captive of a process that is driven by politicians like myself. So what assurance do we have that you're going to have adequate resources, the staff, the technology, the people, over and above the authority to execute any kind of meaningful regulation of an industry which is almost impossible to describe, let alone regulate. Senator, a couple of things. I want to agree with you on your point about regulation versus non-regulation. This area needs to be regulated. All components of it need to be regulated, without a question. Second, in terms of responsibilities and the, you know, this, this narrative of small or weak agency couldn't be farther from the truth. I shared that with Senator Bozeman, and I can give you reasons why. We have a separation of duty and a separation of responsibilities at the agency in terms of months-long enforcement action. That is done by the enforcement team. They are best in class in the world, and they are laser-focused on this right now, and they will get the job done. That is completely separate than our policy divisions and those that regulate entities 
and do the day-to-day -day work of examinations and regulations of our institutions, including the institutions in your state. In terms of why I'm gonna be honest and be very forthright about what I need to do what I need to do, I'm always happy to come before this committee and tell you what I think and tell you what I need, but I'd much rather be at the CFTC doing my job right now. So I'm gonna tell you what I need because I need to do my job and I need to fulfill the mandate that you provide to me. So if you provide me authority to oversee cash market commodity digital tokens, I will be very transparent with you about what I need to fulfill that responsibility 110% without. I don't, I don't question your uh, commitment to this, your honesty or your experience, but you are going to go through a political process to determine whether you have dollar one to deal with this. The last thing I'll say is I've heard some of my colleagues say, we gotta move on this fast. We've gotta be the leader in the world when it comes to cryptocurrency. I don't know if they're saying that now as they did a month ago. The, the notion, and some people have actually articulated to me, do you realize Malta's on the march in terms of becoming a major factor in cryptocurrency? How about Portugal? How about El Salvador? Well, I'm just telling you, I happen to believe reflecting on Chicago, your agency, and the SEC for a moment, there's a hell of a lot more credibility when the United States says this is properly regulated and the world can respect it. And we ought to take the time to make sure we not only salve our consciences, but uh, make sure that we provide the resources to get that kind of regulation. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Chairman, you... you uh, talked a little bit about uh, Ledger X, but is Ledger X the only part of FTX that you actually have regulatory authority over? Are there other aspects of the company that you have uh, regulatory authority over or just uh, Ledger X? Senator, in terms of direct authority, Ledger X is the only entity that we have direct oversight over. There is a, a commodity pool operator, I believe, that's called Ledger uh, it might be Ledger Prime, um, and it is mainly regulated by the National Futures Association, which is a self-regulatory organization, SRO. So there is an indirect relationship, but I did want to mention that to you out of, in full transparency. But to answer your question directly, the single entity that we regulate and have the most direct relationship with is Ledger X. And what is the status financially of Ledger X at this point in terms of assets and obligations? And in terms of your ability to make sure that it retains those assets to cover its obligations. It is solvent. It is operational. I know where the money, the customer money is on a daily basis through direct communications with both Ledger X and the custodian, which holds the digital assets and the money, the fiat money. The company has financial resources for up to 12 months on a rolling basis. There are books and records that we can examine on a daily basis. And are you able to, with the authorities you have, make sure that dollars, resources, assets are not siphoned off away from Ledger X? I mean, you're telling us that Ledger X is your responsibility based on the authorities you have for this larger company, FTX, right? Correct. You're saying that it is solvent, it is operating, it has assets to meet its obligations. Correct. Are you able to make sure it stays that way so that those resources are not dissipated to these other entities of the larger company. So I would say absent fraud, we are able to do that. And I think particularly in, a mo in this moment in time where the other, the majority, the 130 entities are going through bankruptcy uh, and there is a laser focus from John Ray, the current CEO of FTX, and there's a lot of scrutiny about Ledger X and the other entities, um, it would require uh, you know, a significant, significant act to have money move out of that entity without approval or that would violate our laws and take them out of compliance and put that entity in any jeopardy. So you feel you are doing everything you need right now to try to maintain the solvency of Ledger X? It, is, it has been the number one focus since we learned about the potential for the bankruptcy is to make sure customer property at the Ledger X entity, the CFTC re registered entity, stays exactly where it is. And that's why we're having daily communications with both the custodian and the registered entity. Well, and this goes to my broader question is, okay, then to properly regulate crypto, you have to start with defining, uh, are you 
regulating the commodity aspect of it, the securities aspect of it, or the currency aspect, correct? So right. first, how do you define it? And then how do you determine who regulates or has that jurisdiction? And then third, how do you coordinate it between yourself, the SEC, the Federal Reserve, Treasury, so forth? Uh, Senator, I'll first say from a, a potential currency or payments element, and this probably goes to stable coins, um, if it is in fact or a product is used as more of a payments or currency uh, element, it would be outside of the CFTC's remit. Um, in terms of the security or commodity question, you and I, I think maybe have had this discussion before, but it really goes to the heart, at, at least today, of the traditional legal analysis of what a security is and what a commodity is. That said, there are unique characteristics of these digital commodities. It will require hard work and collaboration between us and the SEC to further define what characteristics make up a digital commodity and a digital security. The DCCPA exempts securities. I've said this before, the DCCPA and other similar bills are not a power grab it is filling a gap in the commodity cash market. If we don't fill the gap, there will be fraud and there will be customer losses in the future. I am confident, the CFTC, the SEC, I am committing to you that we will work together, we will figure out a path forward to have a reasonable, productive, and effective means to figure out what is a security token and what is a commodity token and who should regulate. How do you do that? How do you do that with all those other agencies make that determination and sort out the jurisdiction and make sure that you have the authorities and then apply that not only from the standpoint that you're dealing domestically in a global market with all these different products. How do you do that? Senator, I, you know, we've done it historically with futures products and swaps products, but just to give you a hypothetical and how we play this out, if, if, a, if the DCCPA or a similar bill were passed into law and I had authority to oversee these cash markets, I think the first steps that would happen is I would speak with my counterpart, uh, Chairman Gensler. We would have our teams get together and start to flesh out a, a framework for what are the main characteristics of securities tokens, what are the main characteristics of commodity tokens, and then just work through more you know granular details of what unique characteristics are. And you know we have I think on the the biggest exchange in the U.S. 200 plus tokens being traded. We would have to go through each token and figure out what are the characteristics and is it a security or commodity. That sets precedent. That is the benchmark and the foundation for the future. It's a process we've done in the past and we can continue to do it in the so, future. So should this legislation, whether it comes out of this committee or banking or one of the other committees of jurisdiction, have some kind of clearinghouse mechanism like you often have in commercial or in financial markets to sort that out in order, in order for all this to work? So I... I will say this is um, I trust, I, I want to impart on you that we can do this, but if that is something you're interested in, I would certainly welcome the opportunity to work with you. The balance that we always have to strike with statute versus regulations is, especially in an industry like this, I need a steer and, and direction from you. I need prescription to give me a clear path forward of what my mandate is, but it shouldn't be too prescriptive to the extent that the technology can uh, outrun uh, the law because it's gonna be a lot easier for me to change rules through the public comment process mm -hmm. than obviously you to change the law. But it does go to exactly what we've been talking about here and that's looking at the legislation before this committee to make sure that it does all the things it needs to do, not only so you can enforce uh, the crypto aspects under your jurisdiction, but so that you can coordinate with the other financial agencies that are gonna need to be involved to you know, deal with with crypto on a on a broad basis, not only in this country but globally. Absolutely, Senator, and I think it, especially given the circumstances that we're in today and what happened in the past few weeks, that elevates the need to just take a fresh look and to see where there may be gaps where we can strengthen the bill. But I would say this: um, strengthening the bill and filling the gaps is one thing. We need to move forward as soon as possible. We don't want this to happen again in the next few months and have the risk of customers losing money because of these gaps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will indicate there is a vote going on. I will be stepping away to uh, vote. Hopefully our members who are here have already done that. And uh, we have members that are left. I'm going to leave the gavel uh, in Senator Bozeman's hands. And I told him I would be watching him, though. But I, uh, but, uh, uh, I, get, but, I get a little bit of responsibility here. That's right. So I'm going to, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being here. But I apologize. I need to step away. Thank you. 
Senator Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been waiting to be called on all morning, and I, I, obviously it was new leadership that was required in the committee in order to be called on, so thank you. I'm grateful for that. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being here today. You know, one curiosity I have and a thing that's given me pause is just thinking about why FTX would have lobbied so hard for a bill that it, it could never comply with. Do you have any insight into that at all? Um, Senator, I, I, I've thought I'm about I'm sure that. you've thought of I've thought about that myself, um, and it, you kind of hit the nail on the head, right, because I, I can't speak to what Mr. Bankman-Fried or anyone at FTX was thinking when they were advocating for regulation, but the, the remarkable thing is to think about it in the context of compliance, right, and what we've learned about the FTX entities, and just thinking about the bill that uh, Senator Sabinow and, and Bozeman introduced, the, you know, they would have been so far out of compliance that it just it wouldn't have even been possible. The, uh, I was happy to hear you say earlier to Senator Grassley that you thought in the wake of what's just happened that we need to keep an open mind about what this legislation ultimately is going to look like. And uh, you've already suggested a couple of provisions that you think we ought to, uh, we ought to add. I think probably everybody on the committee would share that view. I hope that they would. And, and the need to act urgently at the same time. One of the things that worries me is in the we have to regulate here we have to do it one of the things that worries me is that we might inadvertently be giving the seal of approval to a you you described it as um validation validation to senator thune but the seal of approval to a global enterprise that we don't know enough about to 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 say to Colorado's teachers and firefighters, you know, this is stuff you should invest your pension money in. I mean, can you talk about some of the risks here? Of, you, you said that you would err on the side of accountability and err on the side of consumer protection. I think that's the, r the right impulse to have. It doesn't make it any less complex, the, 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 the balance. No, it doesn't. And, and when I, you know, I have had these conversations with my colleagues in the regulatory space about, um, you know, what does this mean in terms of systemic risk? What does it mean? We've been now through two major crises, if you think about the spring in Terra Luna and now FTX, and the traditional banking, the regulated banking system is safe. There's been not no even contagion. A, no contagion, no even market resiliency issues. So let's keep it that way. Why, why would we even dabble in the idea of changing? And what I always come back to is, you know, especially since 2008 after the crisis, We've been through a lot of bumps in the past two years with COVID and then the Russia-Ukraine war and the impact on volatility in commodity markets and, and markets generally. Our regulations work. They work very well. Our markets are resilient. Um, and the improvements we made in, after 2008 are very impactful and effective. And my thought process is, yes, I understand that there's been no contagion, but I have to think about that risk to customers and this idea that gaps exist and that future crises might happen and I can't just sit back and not do anything. But I always lean back on the fact that our regulations work. So if we did bring this into the regulatory fold, then what are we essentially accomplishing? We're eliminating the probability of these FTX type implosions occurring. So and how do we how do we eliminate or prevent contagion from happening as a result of one of these? I'm not arguing that there yeah. shouldn't be regulation. I'm arguing that we need to do it in as intelligent a way as we possibly can. We, we eliminate contagion by applying the same principles of financial regulation that we apply to traditional finance to the digital asset. So let me ask you about that. In this, this, I'm not an expert about in digital assets, but um, if there were not an existing regulatory structure here, if we didn't have an SEC and we didn't have a CFTC, um, why would it make sense to lodge the responsibility to regulate, to make these determinations about whether it's a security or commodity and all the other determinations you were just talking about with Senator Hoven in two agencies versus one and or or and and are there are there bad things that could happen as a result of 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 having that disparate oversight? So you know we have very different. 
uh, missions. Uh, I, you know, the SEC is a capital formation and uh, investor disclosure based uh, agency. We are a risk management and price discovery agency. Um, one thing that I've uh, been very cognizant of since becoming chair, and I was commissioner since 2017, but you know, this, there's this debate about the two market regulators is not new. It's been going on you know, in this body for years. But standing alone, as I have conversations with my colleagues across the globe, the CFTC and the SEC are two of the largest regulators and regulate the largest markets in the world by far. So standing alone, we're in, in, immensely impactful and have huge remits, far greater than most any other regulator in the world. So it's for those reasons, I think, where it's effectively um, separate and each agency accomplishes its goals. To your point about do we miss anything, I would just point to the markets we oversee. This, this issue about securities versus commodities really first came up in the early 80s with futures products. Mm -hmm. There are security futures and there are commodity futures. Bulk of them are commodity futures, but there's security futures. And this came up after the financial crisis, security-based swaps and commodity swaps. And we have done, the two agencies, a very comprehensive job in filling all the gaps. There are essentially no gaps. And I feel very confident today telling you that we can do the same thing in the digital asset. And, and just with the last 40 seconds I have, can you please, um, um, you've said it already today once or twice, define the gap for us as you yeah. understand it. So there is, um, based on, on, on the SEC statement, authority to regulate security tokens. The CFTC, the authority stops right now at derivatives markets. We only regulate financial products whose price is based on an underlying commodity. So the gap that exists is what's called cash commodity digital tokens. The Securities Exchange Commission does not have authority to regulate or oversee any commodity and we, the CFTC, do not have any authority to regulate cash commodity markets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Braun. I've been watching, uh, it's been an interesting conversation. Um, let's talk about currency itself. That seems to be the most important part of the discussion. Do you think anything with the volatility that crypto has shown can ever become a medium of exchange in the sense that fiat and sovereign currencies have become. And you look at that analog, uh, you don't have near as many exchanges. I just look to see how many exchanges are out there. I mean, it's uh, a couple pages full. Um, do you think in the long run we'll get through with this interesting technology that has so much to offer, not only on the provenance of stuff, but to be kind of that... Uh, foundation for currencies. Uh, will volatility, the way we've seen it, do you think that is just the early stages of it, or do you think it'll be inherent to cryptocurrency going forward? Senator, I, I think, um, one, you can never predict what's going to happen, but I would say if we look in the past, say, 12 months, from the beginning of 2022 to where we are right now, um, and especially focusing on the events in the crypto digital asset space in April and May when Terra Luna and some of these bankruptcies at these large lenders and, and hedge funds occurred. The, the price movement of, and I'm going to use Bitcoin as the most prominent example, um, moved significantly downward from a much more elevated price. And then the spread or the volatility has really narrowed uh, more so than it ever has historically. We've largely been in a $5,000, which is a huge move, right, relative to what you're saying, but relative to the history of the Bitcoin volatility, in the past six months, it's been very narrow relative to its past. So is that a sign of things to come? Possibly. And could we end up in a situation where Bitcoin or other digital currencies really start to narrow and you have that pressure from bidders and uh, buyers and sellers where that range is, is much more narrow? It's possible. I would say also quickly, the technology under... The, the undergird of the, uh, the foundation of the technology is really an issue. The cost from a payments perspective, which I'm sure you've read about, those are issues that I think have to be figured out in order for the application of these tools in, in traditional finance and, and payment systems to be applied. And the other thing we can uh, kind of turn the page back to, the dot-com explosion had a lot of these characteristics. Many of those stocks went up 10 times on public issue. 
ended up maybe either being uh, of no value or selling way under and kind of the same dynamic there. We'll see over time. Uh, security or commodity. Uh, d wouldn't you think the entities within, the exchanges, maybe ought to be regulated by the SEC and whatever we end up with that has more characteristics of a uh, commodity, the currencies, end up being uh, regulated by your agency. Uh, is there any need that it would have to be regulated all by one or the other? I, I, I you know, made this comment before, Senator, and I appreciate the question that, you know, under existing authority for the SEC, they cannot oversee a commodity, right? Any commodity class, whether it's... But we're st still trying to define what they are right. and what all the elements are within it. We are. Um, I think many of the characteristics should really be driven by historical precedent about what a commodity is and what a security is. is. I, I said this before. If we, we look at the Howey test from uh, 1946, right, it's an investment money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit from the work of others, right? Those are the core characteristics of a security. Security, and those same fundamental characteristics should be applied to a digital commodity. There probably will likely be different things that we have to add and think about, but fundamentally that's what we're thinking about because the SEC was created to bridge information gaps between issuers and investors. The CFTC was created to create a market-based structure so that commodities can be traded in a transparent, fa fair, and resilient way. That's probably a pretty good paradigm, at least now. Uh, a lot of it is... Uh, structured simply because those are the existing guidelines as well. Uh, here, I think, is the biggest issue. This is a fledgling concept. It's arcane to many, um, but it also looks like it's got huge potential because when you look at sovereign currencies, uh, those haven't, uh, in terms of a medium of exchange, it's a hostage to whatever your fiscal policies and your central banking policies are as well. You know, I, th I think we need to really err on the side of uh, making sure that we don't smother it, over-regulate it. It definitely needs some regulation so that we don't uh, take what might be you know, the salvation for many places that don't even have a country that performs in a sovereign way, let alone a currency. So how um, aware are you of the fact that uh, I look at, Bernie Madoff, uh, you know, there's, he was a guy that was a crook involved in retirement. And we're going to have some of that here now, and we might be looking at that being litigated as well. But you still don't want to take the exception, the outliers, and take something this new, this unknown, and put a wet blanket on it for all the future potential it has. Uh, just give me your general thoughts on that. Senator, I, you know, I, I'm going to focus on my responsibility as a market regulator and coming to you and telling you what I'm seeing in markets and the risk to customers and where the regulators Do you want to make an are. opinion on that outside of your bailiwick? Maybe in the hallway, but probably not right now. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, good, good conversation. Thank you, Senator. Senator Booker. Mr. Chairman, thank you very Best much. Best for the last. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that. And thanks for the work that you've done. And it's been a really bipartisan effort to try to create a regulatory regime that would protect against many of the issues we've discussed. It's good to see you. And uh, you have been extraordinarily available to me and my team as we've been trying to forge a path forward to protect consumers, create more transparency. And I just have a lot of respect for you, uh, not only because you're from New Jersey, but because you do a heck of a, a good job. So I'm, I'm grateful. Um, so we know millions of Americans now have been uh, scammed by this colossal uh, FTX uh, failure. Uh, their exposure uh, has lost a lot of folks uh, their resources, um, and for some people, their, um, their hopes and dreams and security. Uh, we have the responsibility, as you know, and a lot of my team, a lot of my uh, colleagues have expressed already to really understand the impacts of this deception, uh, what are the real regulatory gaps to help to inform our regulatory actions, and how we can work to uh, create a new space with uh, a lot of abuse, uh, how we can make sure that there are actually opportunities within it for the future. Uh, uh, Chairman, when you and I last spoke uh, in the committee, I communicated that I actually had a lot of optimism, not in these coins or any particular commodities, but the underlying technology that there could be hope that we could see, uh, often for lower income folks who are dealing with banks that 
uh, overcharge or have ridiculous fees that we could begin to create more expanded opportunity for people that are often either abused by the banking system as it stands right now or who don't have access to a lot of the conveniences and opportunities within the banking system. So I'm still hopeful um, that this technology can provide economic opportunities for the underbanked uh, and folks who've been left behind uh, by traditional financial institutions. But that said, without legislation like the DCCPA, uh, we are leaving those these same groups of people that I'm most concerned with really vulnerable as we've just seen. And so we know that there are issues in the industry and have been said by my fellow committee members from the scams, uh, fraudsters, risky uh, over leveraged projects, inadequate disclosure, and more that are really uh, causing these difficulties. Um, and I think that FTX blow up is actually indicative of other things that have happened that maybe not have captured as much attention. And so I'm a supporter of the Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act and still believe that the provisions within it would have solved many of the problems we've seen recently had FTX you know, been registered in the United States, which is a big issue we're not really focusing on. Yeah. Um, but many of the actions that have been allegedly perpetrated are actually have been crimes in this country for over a century. Uh, and so the legislation is not going to solve everything. But I think it's important that we move forward with providing a regulatory framework that can protect consumers. And so the first question, I, I just want to set some things straight, and you've touched on them a bit, but uh, it's been widely discussed in the media that the Stabenow-Bozeman uh, bill, of which I'm a, a, a proud co-sponsor, uh, is an S, uh, a SBF bill or an FTX bill. Um, and this doesn't match any of the experience I've had with the legislative process. Um, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried did give a lot of feedback, as did many others uh, from industry, from academia, uh, from the policy community, from your shop and beyond. And everyone's feedback was considered by the chair and the ranking member, who I think did an extraordinary job in, uh, in, in getting input from lots of folks. So can you speak a little bit more to this allegation or this idea uh, of the involvement of FTX. You talked about your calendar and what they were talking about, but can you speak to the involvement of FTX in the process of developing the piece of legislation that you've been such a principal advisor to us on? Thanks, Senator. Um, as far as I know, given conversations that we have had with the committee, because as you pointed out, we were um, very engaged in providing technical assistance and legal analysis, which is you know typical process for an authorizing committee and, and the agency it oversees. And we are continuing to look forward to doing that with you as we, we think about the bill going forward. Um, and, and as I know that the chairwoman and ranking member were very inclusive in their exercise of inviting folks in. Uh, we took a lot of meetings. You know, I mentioned that I met with uh, Mr. Bankman Freed and, and his team 10 times, and we had some message exchanges, mostly about this application for the clearinghouse. But certainly as meetings go and conversations go, we were talking about meetings he was having with uh, other regulators or discussions he was having. And, and I'm going to cut you off. I think you've yeah. made my point for me. We, you've met with me a, a, a handful of times yeah. on this, and I'm just a junior senator from New Jersey. I imagine collectively you've met with us dozens and dozens of times members of this committee, including test testifying. Um, and, and in that private conversations we had, your mission is not about the wealth of individuals. It's about the protection of consumers and financial security uh, uh, for, um, for, for Americans. Is that correct? Yes, 100%. 100%. Okay, so uh, financial commodity, uh, financial criminality, rather, is, is just not new. As I've said, uh, we know that FTX is accused uh, of crimes, of things that have been crimes in a long time, for a long time. In those cases, enforcement and transparency appear to be the most important issues. We, we know in the financial world, the, your agency as well as the uh, FTC have, have done a lot of work in enforcement. And so the Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act, among other things, was written to bring more resources to Commodities Futures Trading Commission's ability to create enforcement in this, in this space. Would you, just in my remaining seconds, expand upon the authority and resources enumerated in the bill 
uh, that have given you the ability to prevent something like uh, what recently happened with FTX. Again, if FTX had been yep. uh, uh, registered in the United States, what are the tools that this bill would give you to protect consumers and prevent some of the things alleged with FTX. Senator, thank you. Just quick context is right now, I've said this before, every enforcement action we bring in the digital asset space is because someone comes to us. Right. And that is not healthy, and that is not good. It touches, as the chairwoman said, I said this, the tip of the iceberg, right? There is a whole area in the shadows. We need registration of exchanges. We need surveillance of market activity. We need direct relationship with custodians who are holding customer money so that we can prohibit and prevent money moving around that's not house money. There are so many tools in a comprehensive regulatory framework that will put us as boots on the ground in the entity to prevent all of these illegal activities. Thank you very much. And Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, slash ranking member, I really want to thank you. This has been one of the better bipartisan experiences I've had to try to do what's necessary to bring transparency, bring accountability, uh, bring regulation, and create a real enforcement agency that has the resources to go after people doing bad things. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here. And uh, this as Senator Booker just alluded to, this really has been a very, very helpful uh, hearing. Uh, what we want to try and do is just give you the tools in your toolbox to protect consumers. Uh, I was the rank, I was the chairman of the Financial Services Subcommittee on Appropriations a couple Congresses ago. Had the opportunity to work with Chairman Gensler in his role that you have right now and really enjoyed working with him. He's a very talented guy. Have really enjoyed getting to know you and your staff and the great job that you all are doing. Again, you all being very talented, uh, a very talented team. Uh, this is something, you've got, a, you've got a portion of this. SEC's got a portion of it. And I know that, uh, you know that you all have the ability and the want to to get this done. A lot of this is gonna depend on, on you all getting together and just helping us figure out a path forward. But we do have to find that path in an ex expeditious way or we're going to wind up talking about, uh, you know, the new FTX uh, in the not-too-distant future. So with that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.